Professor, Department of Medicine, to say a few words about today's workshop. Hello, a very warm morning to everybody of you and all those who are listening this uh, very workshop. Uh, it was a no novel idea which was proposed by the Department of Radiology uh, to Dr. Modak that uh, can he conduct a kind of a workshop for uh, in, in adult echocardiography. Now, uh, what I best know about radiologists and sonologists is that they are best in imaging techniques, but some of the other they are not trained, especially people who are working uh, in smaller places where they do not have access to workshops or conferences. And many times uh, physicians and surgeons and maybe uh, sometimes gynecologists need some help uh, to know the cardiac functions. Now, uh, it's very difficult for a radiologist who is practicing in, in periphery and who has not attended many conferences on echocardiography. Uh, he uh, would find it difficult to say no and also would be very, very, uh, very much anxious to give the results. So this very workshop which is conducted uh, by this department of radiology from NKP SIMS and, um, and to tell you the truth, Dr. Anil Modak is the one of the first echocardiographist of Nagpur and I, I remember him when I was a resident uh, in 1981, he started uh, echocardiography at a, very, at a very basic level in GMC Nagpur. See, see, almost now uh, 40 years that he is practicing and he is an excellent teacher, he has attended so many workshops, he has been a faculty to uh, workshops in echocardiography. So uh, I am very sure that you are going to get uh, excellent knowledge about how to uh, do an echocardiography and the basics of echocardiography uh, which uh, would enable you to do uh, some kind of uh, echocardiography in difficult situations especially in areas where you do not have a physician come cardiologist who does an echocardiography or a full-time cardiologist available. So with those few words I hand out the mic to Dr. Prashant. Thank you sir. <clears throat> Thank you Dr. Avinash and Dr. Uh, Dr. Ramesh Mundle sir for being here uh, with us uh, today morning. Uh, I am also thankful to Samsung Electronics for providing support for this uh, series of webinars. This is the 12th program we are doing and uh, I am thankful to Watchwiz Technologies, our uh, NKP SIMS uh, uh, head of the departments, Dr. Humne Madam <coughs> and uh, uh, Dean and Dr. Mitra sir for uh, giving us permission to conduct this series of webinars. So uh, with this introduction, we uh, switch over to uh, Dr. Anil Modak sir, who will start his uh, PPT and then followed by the uh, live demonstration. Thank you all. Buddy, I welcome you all. Good morning everybody and I welcome you all to this uh, session of basics of transthoracic echocardiographic examination in adults. Uh, quite often I am being called by radiologists to do echocardiography and uh, they call me because they know that I can do it. But many times when I been to this place, yes, the more younger radiologists were interested in knowing echocardiography. I said why, why you want to learn this? The answer was they are from periphery where often they may not get uh, either physician or cardiologist who can do echo for them. And many times the situation arises that they want something to be told to the treating physician that what is the problem and whether that problem can be solved right there only or it should be referred to the higher centers. So with this concept we have designed this uh, project for for the radiologist who want to involved in doing echocardiographic screening. I don't say that you, one can be very perfect in any every field, but those who can do screening and decide whether the patient is suffering from any serious problem or then it can be managed right there only. So I think I'm, I'm going to talk to you about uh, basics of transthoracic echocardiography examination in adults. This will be restricted to normal echocardiograms only. Subsequently, if you like this, then we can even switch over to more subject oriented. Uh, now, ever since ECHO was introduced in 1954, the technology and knowledge of ECHO has expanded. 
Now standards. American Society of Ecocardiology in 1980. In 2011, British Society of Ecocardiology established new standards for 2D echocardiography. In 19, 2019, AAC further updated the standards of 2D echo. And my this uh, is based mainly on 2019 AAC uh, AAC um, guidelines. The topics I will be. i will try to cover is instrumentation which i always feel is absolutely essential because that can make or that can break everything you know so if you know about instrumentation then you can have good uh, images that two dimensional echocardiographic imaging two dimensional measurements where to measure how to measure m mode measurements color doppler imaging spectral doppler imaging and examination sequence these are the the card depicts about the various windows now i'll just try to show you this is the apical window windows are the places from where you can put the probe and get the images so this is apical window which is as the name suggests it is over the apex of the heart and apex we define the lower most lateral most portion of the heart so wherever the apex may be may be in third space fourth space fifth space wherever it may be you have to put the probe over apex of the heart and from there you can get the apical views there, there are many views which will be which will be discussing subsequently this is another important window is called as parasternal window now parasternal window is very close to the sternum as the name suggests mostly our heart is located on the left side so we use left parasternal window so whenever i use word parasternal it always means left parasternal window unless it is specified as right parasternal window for dextrocardic patients then this is this violet color is the subcostal window which is just below the end of the sternum in the epigastric region maybe to the left maybe to the right depending upon what you want to screen and this green is on the top of the sternum is the suprasternal window this is for the examination of uh, the ascending and arch of the aorta and its branches now scanning maneuvers we all are doing these maneuvers but just i am going to just tell you the names of these maneuvers but we do it without just maneuvering the probe we cannot get the images so these are tilt then sweep then rotate slide rock and angle of transducer is needed to be optimal echo images so you have to take this various maneuvers to get the optimal image now this optimal images we have to take 
according to these planes which I have shown in this figure. So this blue, this blue flame is parallel to the long axis of the left ventricle. We all are aware that this probe, the probe is like it works like a knife, and wherever you probe and in which direction you probe, you will get a slice of the organ viewed. So if you want to take the slices of the heart parallel to the long axis of the left ventricle, then you have to follow this blue pattern. Okay, then perpendicular to this blue is green. Can you see this green picture? This one, this green, this green frame is perpendicular to this to the long axis of left ventricle, and this will give you short axis slices of the heart. And this violet, this is parallel to the four chamber view of the heart. So you have to get these views by doing these maneuvers. Okay, now scanning maneuvers are tilting, where you can tilt antero keeping the probe in same position. If you tilt the probe anteriorly or posteriorly, that is how you can get different type of sections. This has been shown as a subcostal view, but this can be used even in in patient with parasternal short axis view. We can tilt the probe for apico basal or baso apical. This I will tell you subsequently. Then scanning maneuvers for rotation, keeping the probe in same position. If you get it clockwise or anti. Probe is kept in parasternal region, and here it is point the 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 pointer is pointing towards right shoulder, and this is what you will get parasternal long axis view. If you rotate this by 90 degree, turn this index of the probe to the left shoulder, and you will find a short axis view. Position is same, just you have rotated it clockwise or anti-clockwise, and that is how you can views. This is rocking. the probe from intercostal spaces from second third fourth so whichever intercostal space can give you the best image and because that is very patient dependent there is so there is no fixed formula so you have to then get the best possible image by sliding the probe in various intercostal spaces now all i believe all of you are sonologists who are doing ultrasonograph examination of static organs so just to differentiate between uhg and echo echo is done on a dynamic organ so there are some basic differences between these two technology technology of sonography remains same there is no change machines are same except there is change in software and change in probes otherwise nowadays one machine can accept most of the probes and uh, and most of the studies can be done in the same machine so in uhg You need a low frame rate in in sonography uh, 2D echo. You need a high frame rate. High frame rate is required required because heart is a dynamic organ, and you want to study heart in in a motion, and that is why you need a higher frame rate. It's fine. If your frame rate is high, the image quality deteriorates. That is the means limitations of technology. So in USG, if you see the uh, the figures, they are so crispy and so nice looking, but not so well in in echocardiography because you are studying a motion organ we are interested not in crispy images but we are interested in in, in motion so we want to study the motion of the valves motion of the endocardium so for that you need more dynamic images and that is why it loses its quality now as we all know that the heart is a dynamic organ and there is a systole diastole all these things are there and you want to study a heart in various phases of cardiac cycle so you need ecg gated images which is not required for usg then as i told you echo is done from parasternal region this is called as a uh, echocardiographic window and that should fit that that, that the foot print of the probe should fit in the intercostal space then only you can get the images if it hangs over or if it touches the the rib then all ultrasonographic image uh, so sound will be reflected back and will not get any image so the probe footprint should be small enough to fit in uh, intercostal spaces and that is why you have more smaller print for uh, doing echocardiography in children then index 
of the transducer is displayed on the left side of the screen, while conventionally the index of the transducer is displayed on the right side of the screen. So, this orientation is very, very important to know. So, you can then uh, you may construct the image in your own mind that uh, how the organ should look like. Be because it is important to know whether the right ventricle is, is located in right ventricle, right side only or right ventricle is located on left side. So, that can be made out by uh, knowing that the index is represented on right side or left side. So, in echocardiography, the index of transducer is, is uh, depicted or displayed on the right side of the screen opposite to USG. Then, uh, for Doppler study, most of the UAGs you need only PW Doppler, but for cardiac studies, because there is a lot of flow patterns of flow, the slow frequency, turbulence, high frequency flow. So, you need PW as well as CW Doppler to evaluate the, the flow patterns. So, this is the basic differences between uh, UAG and 2D echocardiography. So, you all because you all are radiologist and you all are doing this every day but just to complete the formalities i will just give some touches of instrumentation which are necessary for 2d echocardiography and which may be little different than uag so several instrumentation settings can be modified during image acquisition and that is called as pre processing or manipulated by the operator after data are collected are called as post processing so these are important for optimal image acquisition and to have a optimal image acquisition is absolutely crucial for sonography and for echocardiography as well so grayscale so system processes the data to enhance and suppress signals to create echocardiographic image in various shades of gray so, high amplitude signals are depicted as white and low one as black. So, we have a grayscale in the range of 0 to 255 shades and unfortunately, human eye cannot differentiate all these shades. We can differentiate few of the shades in a given scale. So, uh, keeping this thing in mind, then various uh, this grayscale maps are created which can manipulate to optimize the images. Now, dynamic range. What is dynamic range? Which adjusts the grayscale settings. This settings changes the ratio between the highest and the lowest received echo amplitude in image. So, dark, most dark and most white cannot be depicted in same image. So, you have to then select the maps which can show you average uh, grayscales which are absolutely needed to get the proper picture. So, low dynamic range image will produce a high contrast image where it will be look very nice all blacks and whites very crispy images but with this you will lose very important intermediate shades which are like uh, endocardial shades then shades which are produced by the the clots which may be lost and you may never know that these are re really existing there or not so the proper maps should be selected to get this scene so, how should be dynamic range? It should be such that endocardium and myocardium should be seen separately. So rather than seeing a crispy images in black and white, you should get such map that, that should able to differentiate the softer images which are created by endocardium and myocardium and they should, you should able to separate them. Now, the left of Now, dynamic range adjusts grayscale settings. These settings changes the ratio between highest and the lowest received amplitude. So, low dynamic range uh, image will produce high contrast images. This is just now. Now, harmonic imaging. 
the harmonic frequencies are caused by sound beam you all are using very often so harmonic frequencies are caused by the sound beam being uh, distorted as it travels through the tissue so ha harmonic image most commonly uses second harmonic frequency which is twice the fundamental frequency if fundamental frequency is 2.5 megahertz then this uh, uh, second harmonic image will be a 5 megahertz and as we all know the higher the frequency better is the image quality so most of the machines they can process second harmonic frequencies and for that you need a broadband uh, transducer which should able to receive both and, and uh, receive as well as process both uh, fundamental frequencies and harmonic uh, second harmonic frequencies so in second harmonic frequencies the, uh, the image result is an image that appears clearer and there's the signal to noise ratio side it's Now sector size, now depth and sector width, width settings are, may also influence the frame rate. As I told you, the, first, the basic difference between the USG and ECO is the frame rate. Because we are studying the dynamic organ, so we need, we are interested more in frame rate. So if you have better frame rate, then you can have better visualization of the motion of the various structures of the heart. So higher frame rates are desirable to increase the temporal resolution. Re temporal resolution means uh, the moment in relation to time, particularly for rapidly moving structures like the valves and endocardium. So deeper and wider sectors will reduce the frame rate and number of image lines per sector. So image quality will be reduced. Now just, just to quote an example, you can see if the frame rate is low, you can see mitral wall in closed position, then you next frame will see mitral wall in open position. But in between, how mitral wall is opened, it will be lost. So to have all the possible moments of the valve, then you should have more frame rate so that you can see how valve is opening. So that is achieved only by decreasing the sector size and the depth of the sector. Now frame rate, as I told you, frame rate is very crucial in echocardiographic examination. So higher frame rates are desirable for better resolution. So frame rate can be increased by decreasing the depth, decrease the depth, if you want to study metal, then just reduce the sector to metal only. Avoid seeing the right side of the heart. So that can improve the frame rate. If you want to study right side of the heart, then shift the sector to the right side of the heart. So after having studied the overall echo, then restrict your examination to particular organ or part of the organ where you want to study properly. Probe frequency. The higher the frequency, better the resolution. All you all know this. So, but lesser the penetration. So you, you are using multiple probes for superficial organs, your probe frequency may be around 5 o'clock, for deeper then you may even go 2.5 or 2. But where you want more depth, but then you have to compromise for the quality of the image. So lower the probe frequency, better is penetration, but lesser is resolution. Nowadays, broadband probes are available like, like camera zoom lenses, where you can change the, the focal length of camera. So similarly, then you have probes which can change its frequencies. 
so for adult uh, echocardiography we need 2 to 5 megahertz probe in which is ideal which can go up to uh, for superficial structures like uh, entry wall of the right ventricle or LV apex or deeper structure like posterior wall of the uh, left ventricle. So other features which should be uh, adjusted are overall gain, time gain compensation, transducer beam focus and zoom magnification. This is then an example of zoom magnification. So this portion of the heart which is left ventricle outflow tract, aorta and the aortic cusp has been zoomed. If you zoom then this can give you better visualization, you can have a better way this better way to have man, uh, uh, measurements and this can give you a better picture because the less ultra beam so ultrasonic energy is being used for this small area. So this can be used for this purpose. Now here this is the overall gain this which is being used where the when you increase the overall gain knob then all the frequencies are increased like your sound system when you increase the overall volume it will increase all the volumes which are coming from the speaker or you can decrease like in this the all the frequency will be decreased so keep it to a optimum so that endocardium should be seen properly now this is an example of time gain compensations here you can adjust the frequencies coming from various depth of the along the axis now if someone who is interested in again sound system there is a, a, a control called as a graphic equalizer which can simply increase decrease the frequencies from either it can be from treble it can be from bass so this is something similar to that now here the frequencies coming from the mid portion of the ventricle is not properly seen so here you can use time gain compensation where these frequencies from this portion can be enhanced so the picture can look so uniform. So uh, use this according to the need, either you can reduce this. The idea of time gain compensation is that the frequencies coming for the, from the near portion of the probe are very stronger than the coming from the probe. So you have to increase the frequencies coming and suppress the for the, the probes for uniform image quality. Images, let us city filters. Now the principle of Doppler echo, you all are aware that there is increase or decrease in the frequency of sound wave when it is reflected by a moving object. It was first proposed by Christian Doppler in 1842. Now this frequency shift is affected by velocity of moving object. Then transmitted frequencies, that is transmitted frequency by the probe and the angle between interrogated beam and the blood flow. This is very crucial. This angle is very crucial and with this angle, if not properly maintained, the frequencies amplitude may be markedly decreased. Now velocity scale. Uh, adjusting the velocity scale allows the spectral Doppler tracing to be displayed as large as possible without aliasing. Now here in left side you can see that the, the, the head or the peak is all cut and it, it got aligned and shown to opposite side of the baseline. So if you adjust the scale, so the whole envelope can be seen properly. This is important for both CW and PW Dopplers. Now sweep speed, that is how many envelopes can be shown on a screen. So default sp uh, sweep speed should be set to 100 millimeters per second or adjusted to optimize the sweep delay on the basis of heart rate. Now ideally two to three spectral Doppler beads should be seen across each sweep. So if you have less number of these envelopes, 
then you can study or you can measure them properly. If you have more number of envelopes, then it will be you will find it difficult to uh, measure them. But sometimes you need more number of envelopes in a screen if you want to study the effect of respiration on the on the flow on the cardiac flow. I will just show you in the picture. This will allow visualization of more than one beat and allows accurate measurements of time interval. I don't know whether you can see this or not. This faint line represents respiratory movements. So we can study the. Volume, sample volume size. Now there is a cursor for for Doppler, which is a vertical line, and over that vertical line, the two transfer lines are seen. Particular that is called as sample volume size. The the di the distance in between those two transfer uh, lines called as sample volume size, and that is the area from where the Doppler signals are processed and displayed. So bigger the sample volume, more will be velocities. Smaller the sample volume, it will be uh, accepting velocities from sm smaller area, so the thinner will be the envelope. So if sample volume is set too large, instead of 4 or 5 mm, if it is made 8 or 10 mm, the Doppler signals may be noisy, making it difficult to distinguish laminar and from turbulent flow. The whole envelope will be filled with velocities and it will lose its importance to be. Uh, pulse volume. Uh, so, the width of the Doppler uh, sample volume sh for inflow and outflow should be 2 to 4 millimeters and for venous flow should be 5 to 7 millimeters. So, for flow for valvular flow either towards or away should be uh, 2 to 4 mm and for venous flow like for pulmonary vein or atrial flow it should be 5 to 7 mm. Even 5 to 7 mm width is good for tissue Doppler imaging also. So sample volume just an example where the bigger sample volume is used you can see that whole envelope is filled and this looks like as if a lot of frequencies are there but if you reduce the sample volume to particular area only a small sample volumes you can see only small frequencies of uh, sound or Doppler can be seen. Now pulse wave Doppler PW Doppler is used when one wishes to measure flow velocities at a particular depth. Try to understand this. If you want to view a depth which is located at maybe at 2 centimeter, 4 centimeter, 5 centimeter, then you can put sample volume there and only from that place velocity will be recorded. The major limitation of PW Doppler is alliance, which is the inability to display a complete velocity waveform at at excessively high velocities. Now, a Nyquist limit is a maximum measurable velocity of that particular probe. It will now, the aliasing occurs when the detected Doppler shift frequency is greater than half the Nyquist limit. Okay. So, this is a limiting factor. It can tell you the location, but it cannot tell you the velocities. This is the problem with pulse Doppler technology a pulse wave Doppler. To overcome this, then high repetition frequency Dopplers are being used where you increase or double the or increase the factor by 2. So, the major limitation is an inability to determine the origin of display of velocity like CW Doppler. This is a normal and this is a, uh, this is a high uh, frequency uh, uh, pulse uh, repetition frequency Doppler and this is CW Doppler. So, CW is better than uh, high PRS. Then CW Doppler. 
there is a continuous wave doppler is used to measure and record high velocities as i told you pw cannot measure high velocities but it can tell you the location pw cw that is continuous wave doppler can measure all the uh, velocities so there is no nyquist limit with cw doppler or continuous wave doppler as transmission and reception of ultrasound are continuous there are two crystals one is throwing the ultrasound second is receiving the ultrasound so continuously uh, this cycle continues and it can record all the frequencies so cw doppler samples the entire range of returning frequencies along the beam path and therefore it is not able to detect the location of the frequency shift so it cannot tell you from where these frequencies are coming but it can tell you how many frequencies are coming this is just an example now this is a four chamber view of and this is the left ventricular cavity uh, this is a patient who has hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and this is a patient who has aortic stenosis if you put a cw doppler here and here in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy the velocity is they increase in mid ventricle in aortic stenosis it is at left ventricular outflow tract but for continuous doppler it is same whether it is coming from mid ventricle or it is coming from aortic valve it will just show you there are increasing frequencies but which place it will not tell you so this is the limitation of cw doppler now cw versus pw doppler now cw doppler there are two crystals as i told you one is transmitting other is receiving in pw doppler there is single crystal which sometimes works like uh, transmitter sometimes works like receiver and that is why there is a limitation in pw doppler then the maximum velocity can be measured with uh, without limitation while limitation due to aliasing the maximum frequency which can be measured by pw is called nyquist limit which is equal to half of the prf so it cannot go beyond that so then aliasing will occur but it can tell you the location so it's not possible to put source of turbulence along the axis of beam in cw doppler but in pw doppler the source of turbulence can be located with the help of sample volume this is an example on the left side it's pw on the right side it's cw so as i told you this is aliasing so the location where aliasing occurs you will know there is a high velocity flow so according to your then clinical judgment you can decide whether this is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or whether it is uh, aortic stenosis so this flow may be produced because of both of them so by knowing the location of aliasing you will know that this is the location where if the location is close to aortic wall then this is because of aortic stenosis if the lo location of aliasing is close to mid ventricle then this is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy this is cw very faithfully the velocities are rep represented but then we can never make out from which location they are coming so this was the problem when pw and cw dopplers were incorporated with 2d but with the incorporation of color doppler this problem is solved and the things have become more easier just this cartoon shows pw transducer and cw transducer and this is pw envelope which is empty only the borders are seen and this is cw envelope where the board with the whole envelope is full of frequencies because it's uh, receiving frequencies from all over the b maxis so this is how you can differentiate by looking at the envelope now color doppler imaging the color doppler imaging is a pulse doppler technique that uses multiple sample volumes along a series of scan lines displayed in an area of a region of interest so in the region of interest you will find a sector which that sector only will show you the color doppler imaging now it is interest it is integrated with 2d images and is affected by 2d gain you will never find isolated color doppler images color doppler images are always superimposed over 2d images so from that you can make out which portion is showing flow how the flow is going and from where the turbulence is occurring so 
the gain of 2D can affect the gain of color Doppler because the same ultrasound is being used for both these technologies, 2D images and for color Doppler. So when you are doing 2D uh, color Doppler imaging, try to keep 2D gain at its minimum just to know the the image. Okay. So the CDI display blood flow characteristics. So what characteristic blood flow can be measured by CDI? It can tell us timing, timing in the cardiac cycle, systolic, diastolic, mid systolic, early diastolic, whatever it may be. Then relative velocity, their high velocity flow, less velocity flow, then direction going towards the probe, away from the probe and presence of turbulence. So to get best display, several parameters need to be adjusted. ROI means region of interest and, and 2D sector size. So before initiating color Doppler, the 2D sector size should be adjusted to the lowest depth and width to accurately depict the anatomic region to be imagined. Okay, so try to keep the width of the color Doppler sector to minimum and depth to be minimum so that can give you the best possible result. So this will help optimize the color frame rate. Again frame rate is important in 2D everywhere. So zoom mode may be best alternative. So setting the ROI uh, that is region of interest as narrow and shallow as possible allows the maximum frame rate and velocity scale. If you want if you want to study mitral wall then the sector width and sector uh, depth should be such that it should cover mitral wall only and if you want to study the flow of mitral wall up to the roof of the right atrium then you have to increase the depth. Okay, So that is how keeping the, the sector size to a minimum you can get the best possible result. Just as an example, here the frame rate is 36.35.6, here frame rate is 14.9. So here the depth is more, depth is less. You can see the whole flow, but here the flow is cut, there is no flow seen beyond this. So the completeness is there in this frame, but not in this frame. So so this is the effect of the sector size. You have, yes, yes, size has covered the whole frame. Yes, the size is restricted to this much only. So this has increased the frame rate. Now color gain. The color flow Doppler gain should be adjusted by slowly increasing the color gain until there is random color flow speckles beyond the borders of the anatomic area of the interest. I will just explain you this followed by slowly decreasing the gain until speckles disappear. Now this is the area I want to examine. Increase the gain of the, this color till you can see color speckles over the endocardium and over the myocardium. Once these have appeared, then reduce it to the tune that it should just disappear and that is the ideal color, color gain. So if you are then adjusted the ideal color, color again for that particular study, you can see the difference. There is a ideal color gain and you can see the whole pulmonary vein flow. But here color gain was less, so everything is lost except this very minimal flow is being seen over here. So the adjustment of color again, again make, will make a lot of difference. Now color maps. The most basic maps display the direction of the flow. Almost universally, the flow towards the transducer is red, while flow away from the transducer is blue. This is universal color code, but if you want, you can change it. There is, I mean, the, the facilities are there, but by and large, it is understanding that the color code should be, that the, to the flow should be such that if it is going towards the probe, it should be red and going away from the probe should be blue. So velocity, so by keeping such probe, uh, you can make out how the blood is, in which direction blood is flowing. So the velocity range in each direction represents Nyquist limit for limiting the frequency and transducer being used. Typically scale setting should be 50 to 70. 
Now here is uh, color map velocities. Another thing, once I have told you about color code, blue and red. Now color map, different differentiate flow velocities. Now although it is going towards the probe, it will be red, but flow velocities again have different shades of red. So the map displays velocity in the same views or intensities, with dark shades depicting low velocity and bright shade representing higher velocities. So dark red means low velocities, bright red means higher velocities going towards the probe. Okay, the so laminar flow tends to be depicted as pure color. If there are multiple frequencies, then you have multiple shades of red or blue. But if the flow is laminar without turbulence, then the velocities will be pure color. The turbulence flow is depicted as multicolor mosaic. Now this is the scale. Here you can see at the top 73, below 73. This is the Nyquist limit beyond which it will not, it will get aliased. Okay, so this is red going towards the probe. This is blue going away from the probe. Here you can see, which means the flow is going towards the probe. This is going probe. The darker shade means it's a frequency is more bright means higher frequency. And here is this red is going towards the probe and suddenly you can find a mosaic pattern suddenly the frequencies have escalated it means there is a steep rise in frequencies and it has crossed the Nyquist uh, limit and aliasing this is color mosaic is aliasing in color doppler this is how it should be interpreted just a frame of the left ventricle where you can see the flow going towards the apex is going away from the apex where the probe is on the top of the apex means the, uh, towards the probe away from the probe if this probe flow is towards the probe then this has to be from LA to LV this blue probe means going away from the probe means this is going towards aorta Velocity scale. The of color flow Doppler velocity scale is an important feature. We appreciate this value represents the range of mean velocity that can be displayed. That is, I uh, just now I told you that is displayed over the scale. As a default, it is recommended that the color flow scale, that is, Nyquist limit, be set between 50 and 70 seconds in each direction. The size of display regurgitant uh, jet is affected by several variables, one being the Nyquist limit, in that the, s the same regurgitant volume appears considerably larger at a lower color scale to higher color scale. Now here color scale is quite low. So looks very large, larger than what it should be. This is the ideal jet. This is how it should look like. And this is very high velocity has been set. So this will look very small. So same jet, by changing the velocity, you can increase or decrease. So if not adjust properly, you may overestimate or you may underestimate the same jet. So these settings are very crucial. Now velocity, use low velocity settings for flow which is slow as in atria or pulmonary vein. So lowering the Nyquist limit, the system display lower velocity brighter. So for higher velocity, we set this Nyquist limit to about uh, 50 to 70. Here we have set to 20 to 30 for venous flow. So this is at 70 and this is at 30. You can see these flows are not seen at all, but here these flows can be seen. So according to which portion of the heart you are examining, you have to change the scale and get the proper images. So this is all about 2D color Doppler. Now I'll switch over to M mode. This was a basic echo, how it was uh, first appeared for clinical examination. When echo was introduced, it was introduced in M mode in 1952-53. And since then, the importance of M mode kept on losing, but still it is, sometime it is needed in some studies. So the primary value of M mode is its 
superior time resolution enhances the display of rapidly moving objects frame rate is 2000 per second per minute now therefore using a rapid sweep speed of 100 to 200 mm per second it is advantageous for making the most accurate time related measurement so here in m mode we can absolutely can see how the metal wall is opening how metal wall is closing how aortic wall is opening so at what rate it is opening all this can be measured in m mode which is not possible in 2d examination because that in 2d the frame rate is hardly 40 to 80 per minute so the timing of movement of certain structures within the cardiac cycle is sometimes best delineated by m mode so this is how the m mode looks like uh this is in relation to time uh, it has been displayed i will tell you in more details subsequently now let us move to the acquisition of various images now from here now this will be different than 2d rather than usg till now mo most of the thing which i talked about you, you may be aware you may be knowing it this was just to brushing up the knowledge now let us move to how to acquire the images now probe positioning for apical four chamber view now probe is placed over cardiac apex as as the name suggests apical means it is to be kept over cardiac apex the pointer of the probe is positioned towards left shoulder here you can see the this red arrow should be pointed towards the left shoulder us beam is pointed towards right shoulder the beam this is just or in this direction the and patient should be in left supine uh, left lateral position or oh, examiner can be on the left side of the patient on the right side of the patient how he is trained how he is comfortable so examiner's position is variable this is a cartoon which shows that we are going to keep the probe here over the apex wherever apex may be it may be in fourth space fifth space sixth space inside the mid clavicular line outside the mid clavicular line but it has to be over apex if you don't keep this over apex then you may underestimate the size or volume of the left ventricle so this is how it looks like apical four chamber view this is the anatomical section and as you all aware anything which is any organ or the part of the organ which is closer to the probe is depicted on the top of the screen this can be changed no doubt this can be changed but i am oriented this way only that the apex is on the top and base at the bottom but those who are new learners can change this and can get acquainted to upright images but this is upside down image so you can see various structures in a slice this is the lv apex then the shape of the lv which which is like a bullet this is the shape of the rv which is triangular this is bigger left ventricle is bigger than the right ventricle you can see the ratio of the left, right ventricle to left ventricle is about right is 1 to this is 3 this is a normal ratio to go this wall this wall is you can see, obviously make out between the wall between the two ventricles and that is interventricular septum there is the free wall of the right ventricle free wall of the left ventricle this is mitral valve this tricuspid wall this right atrium left atrium pulmonary vein everything is seen over here in this 2d image everything same thing so this is the echo which is acquired you can see the antimitral leaflet posterior mitral leaflet this is tricuspid wall interatrial septum which is dividing the, the left atrium and this right atrium next position is keeping the probe in same location that is apical 2c view the probe is placed over cardiac apex pointer of the probe is rotated 30 to 60 degree anti clockwise means towards the left shoulder sorry towards the right shoulder 
movement pointing towards neck us beam is pointed towards right shoulder position is same apical and for fourth chamber it was towards left shoulder now for two chamber it is towards neck this how it looks like this two chamber view the right side chambers are gone what you can see this is the inferior wall this is the entry wall the pointer is towards right shoulder uh, so towards neck so this entry wall is represented and the right side of the screen will show you entry wall because the pointer is towards neck this is metal wall this is left left entry wall. this how it, the two chamber apical two chamber view looks like this is inferior wall this is entry wall lv and left atrium another little anti clockwise where 5 to 10 degree and you will find apical three chamber view again there is inferior wall entry wall and you can see the origin of the aorta from the left ventricle this is the mitral wall left atrium because aorta is in incorporated in this hence, hence called as three chamber view so left atrium left ventricle and aorta now pro position for plax view that is parasternal long axis view now probe is placed in third or fourth intercostal space according to the patient's condition now close to the left border of the sternum as as i told you that when i talk to parasternal it always means left left parasternal region only unless specified so index of the probe is pointing towards the right shoulder and us beam is directed antero posteriorly from sternum down to spine here you can see the pointer is now towards the patient's right shoulder the pointer is um, uh, pointer is towards right shoulder and the beam direction is antero posteriorly and this is how it looks like parasternal long axis view if you go antero posteriorly the first structure will be struck by the ultrasonic beam is the anterior wall of the right ventricle this is entry wall of right ventricle this is the entry wall of right ventricle this is right ventricular cavity outflow tract this is right ventricular outflow tract this is interventricular septum here it is interventricular septum this is lv cavity which looks empty and you may see inter this ivs continues as the anterior wall of the aorta this is the anterior mitral leaflet which continues as the posterior wall of the aorta this is posterior mitral leaflet which continues as the posterior wall of the left atrium and this is the left ventricular posterior wall so these are the various structures you can see in this view anterior aorta posteriorly left atrium same thing same thing you can see in apical four chamber view this is echo image entry wall of the right ventricular rvot ivs lv la and posterior wall now if you give it a little tilt medial tilt to the probe keeping the probe in same position for plax view that is parasternal long axis view you will find right ventricular inflow images this is the long axis of right right ventricular inflow where you can see left atrium tricuspid wall and right ventricle so this is the right atrium right ventricle and this is the tricuspid wall with those who want to study in details is for them otherwise this four chamber view is good enough to give this view also this is i will not explain this because it's difficult to obtain in uh, adults this is good for uh, pediatric age group now pro position of psax that is parasternal short axis view as i told you a perpendicular to the long axis will find a short axis view so the probe is placed in second third same place don't ch don't change the probe position close to the left border of sternum index of the probe is now positioned towards the left shoulder of the patient okay for plax it was right shoulder 
give a 90 degree tilt and now your probe is pointer is facing towards left shoulder and you will find a left axis view and uh, of course the US beam is directed posteriorly. So a pico bezel sweep is taken to get various short axis view. A pico bezel sweep what I mean you you tilt the probe and I give a direction in furrow a pico basal direction sweep give a sweep like this so from apex you give a sweep you will go to base apex it will look like this is a, this is at papillary muscle then this is at basal level so you can get a sweep in short axis now this is this is at the basal level if the, the probe is pointed more superiorly what you will find a central aorta a central aorta which is roundish roundish here and the three leaflets uh, a particular Mercedes Benz which we all of us have been taught right from the third years when we were third year students in pathology that this is how it looks like a Mercedes Benz the upper one right coronary cusp lower one non coronary cusp and on the right of the screen it is left coronary cusp sometimes you are able to see the coronary artery arising from the coronary cusp ok now this is the tricuspid wall this is pulmonary valve right atrium left atrium in between these two atria you can find interatrial septum ok right atrium then tricuspid wall then RV RVOT pulmonary wall and main pulmonary artery so that is how you can so nicely delineate this and the structures in this parasternal short axis view at great vessel level. Now go down little towards apex you will find a fish mouth opening fish mouth opens and closes fish mouth opens and closes this is a mitral valve this is a mitral valve ok a circular absolutely circular slice of the left ventricle like pineapple slice tint pineapple slice over which you can find right ventricle is the interventricular septum and there are the various walls of the left ventricle inferior wall then lateral wall anterior wall and this is septum again go towards more apical you will find this rounded birds and these birds are papillary muscle anterolateral posteromedial two papillary muscles and same walls of the left ventricle circular left ventricle this is right ventricle another is subcostal view uh, rarely we use this view in adults but ideally this view is to be used for pediatrics to study various congenital heart diseases sometimes we have to use this view to see interatrial septum because in this view interatrial septum becomes perpendicular to the beam and any structure which is perpendicular to the beam gives best images ok so th in this image uh, in this view we can clearly see interatrial septal defects ASDs now this view is also needed in, in adults in whom the parasitic window is obliterated now this parasitic window is obliterated in, in some conditions like uh, COPD chronic obstructive pulmonary disease where the lung volume increases it overlaps the bare area of the heart and we all know we all are aware that air is the enemy of sonographic examination so when air intervenes between probe and the structure viewed it, you will not see sonographic images same thing happens when you are facing a problem with uh, uh, surgical emphysema where uh, the lot of air is there and then you may not see the images so in those situations where the diaphragm is pushed down because of the inflated lungs it along with it also pulls down the heart and so heart can be studied well in patient with COPD so these are the two indications mostly where, where subcostal views are important and one very very important uh, examination like to do in this view is the evaluation of inferior vena cava now if you go to ICU or CCU 
Colonel, uh, the first question anyone right from attendant down to the consultant will ask you: IVC is how much? Collapsing is or not? If you go to uh, cardiac center, he will ask you ejection fraction. So these two things anyone can ask you anywhere, you know. So as for critical care is concerned, IVC evaluation is very important, and this can be done in this view. So this is how subcostal view looks like. As I told you, this this you can see here very clearly interatrial septum, which is perpendicular to the beam, and this gives very very good view of interatrial septal defects. Then this is the left ventricle, left atrium, right ventricle, right atrium, and here you can measure the RV wall thickness properly because again the structure is perpendicular to the beam, so RV thickness can be very well examined in this view. This view is also important to evaluate the pericardial effusions because by gravity it may settle down, and some of the cardiologists may put needle to tap pericardial effusion in this view, in this uh, sub-zippered region only. So they can give a better idea of the uh, the size of the pericardial effusion and the depth of the pericardial effusion. How much needle one should put in? This is IVC. You all are much better person to evaluate IVC than what cardiologists or physician can do it. So, and very often needed for volume management to diagnose right ventricular failures and so. M mode just now I told you it's a high sampling rate compared to frame rate of 2D that's 40 to 80. That is why M mode is good to track fast moving structures like valves and endocardium. Now there are various places from where you can take M mode sections. Now this is the parasternal long axis view, and these are the usual three places where you put the probe uh, cursor to get the this M mode images. One is at aortic cusp level, which will give you idea about aortic root and blood, uh, and the left atrium. Second, at the tip of the metal wall, which will give you idea about the moment of the metal wall. How metal wall is opening, closing, at what rate is mo moving, and this is at the just below the tip of the metal wall. This is for evaluation of the left ventricular function, and the tickle is very popular because it's very easy to do. 2D echo evaluation is more time consuming, and everyone is busy nowadays. This everyone wants shortcuts, so this is a good view for that for them. So this is now at aortic root. Anterior aortic wall, you can see this snake like movement, posterior aortic wall. This is distended because of the left atrial expansion, this is collapses because of the left atrial left atrium collapse. So this is the expansion and uh, decompression and decompression of the left atrium which moves the aorta anterior posteriorly. Now here in the center you can see a very faint line that is the closure line of the aortic cusp. Here you can see a box. So this is the box is the opening of the aortic cusp in relation to time. So so nicely you can see each and every moment of the aortic wall and how it is opening, how long it took to open, at what rate it opened. All this can be measured by M mode echocardiography. How long it remained open? This is how you can. This is all it remained open this much. Now it has closed, and again single line can be seen. And this is the left atrium. This is mitral wall. For if you know little hemodynamics of the heart, that uh, there is a systole, there is diastole. If you consider diastole, there are two phases: rapid ventricular filling phase and the atrial contraction. So here you can see this is the AML and this is PML, which is going down. So AML has a M pattern. And then PML has a W pattern. They they move exactly in opposite direction. When this mitral wall has opened, mitral wall has closed. Open, closed. This goes towards septum. Posterior wall goes towards posterior wall. So this is how, and this can be tracked by M mode. So the, so this is the rapid ventricular filling phase. It's called as E wave. Then mitral wall closes because then the flow reduces. And then again, atria contracts. Again, the flow increases. This is called as A wave. And finally, then mitral wall closes 
during systole. So these are the various wave patterns of mitral wall. This is uh, at uh, mid ventricle, just below the tip of the left ventricle. This is the right ventricle, anterior wall of the right ventricle. This is septal movements you can see so well, you know, which you can't see so well in 2D. Here you can see at what rate it is contracting. This is a posterior wall. This is a diastole. This is systole. A tooth-like position is like a systole. So at what rate it is contracting, at what rate it is relaxing, how long it took for systole, so accurately can be measured in a mode, which is not possible in 2D. And this is how, in this view, you can take the left ventricular ejection fraction. This I will demonstrate to you subsequently. So conclusion, before we start doing echocardiography practice, it's important to understand the correlation of echo images with anatomy of the heart. Understanding of cardiac physiology is equally important. And a basic understanding of technology and its limitations. You, sh you must work within limitations. Someone says, Arya, echo karalo. We should know the limitations of echo. Is there possible echo window hai, nahi hai, milta hai, nahi milta hai, what are the limitations? That we should understand. And knowledge of the instrument and its operation system is very, very crucial. So thank you very much for this session. Now we'll switch over to demo.